welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, wonderful Friday morning, afternoon. We uh, really appreciate you tuning in. Um, we've got a great conversation for everyone today. I know that um, COVID-19 vaccination and Duchenne really just remains top of mind for all of us. Um, there's just so many questions that we want to understand. You know, what does access look like? What does safety look like? Are there interactions that we need to be aware of? And so um, we're really happy to bring together a couple of wonderful speakers today to really go through um, vaccine development, approval, access pathways, and answer your questions about COVID-19 vaccination in Duchenne. Um, we're joined by Dr. Timothy Kripe, who's the Chief of Hematology and Oncology at Nationwide Children's Hospital, as well as Dr. Timothy Franson, who is a principal at Fagre Drinker Consulting. Um, and so we're really excited to hear a little bit about um, what they have to share with us today. So essentially for the first half or so of our hour today, we'll go through some more formalized presentation and baseline information. And then around noon or so, we'll go ahead and transition to an open Q&A format. So at that point, you can submit your questions through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead, submit your question, and we'll get through as many as we possibly can during the hour. Um, if we can't get to your question live, rest assured, we're going to provide a written resource as a follow-up to today's webinar. So we'll get through as many of those additional questions through those written resources as possible as well. So at this point, I want to introduce Dr. Timothy Kripe, who, as I mentioned, is the Chief of Hematology Oncology at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and will have some really great information to share with us today on vaccine development and uh, considerations for clinical trials. Dr. Kripe. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, PPMD. Your timing is impeccable. As you know, uh, we've had a flurry of information come out over only in the last few days with the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, of Pfizer's results. And of course, yesterday's uh, FDA advisory meeting and the release of their uh, FDA document so uh, that, that the other Tim will be discussing. So today, and we appreciate that some people have already submitted questions ahead of time, and we've looked at those and tried to incorporate some answers into our formal remarks, but then we'll certainly have plenty of time for informal discussion as well. So we thought we would cover briefly, uh, touch on types of vaccines in development regarding COVID, the outbreak paradigm for development and how this happened so quickly, the side effects that we know about so far, uh, discussion about antigens and cross-reactivity, and then the, uh, the other, Tim, will be discussing framing regulation, science, medicine, regulatory pathways, uh, touch on other uh, vaccines and developing and eligibility as well as knowns versus unknowns. And there are a lot of unknowns, but at least we do have a few knowns. And I would say that uh, even though we're entering and, and are already in some of the darkest times of this pandemic and certainly not rounding the corner yet, I think with this vaccine news, we can see the corner just up ahead that we can round soon. And so it, it gives us all some hope, I think, that... Uh, that we can come out of this nightmare, as it were. So if you could advance to the next slide, Rachel. I just wanted to touch on uh, some of the differences of the different types of vaccines that have been developed. And the three main ones are protein-based, viral vector-based, or mRNA, which are uh, encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle and really don't have anything to do with other viruses as a delivery mechanism. So if you look at the left side as a depiction of the coronavirus with its spike proteins, and it was known ahead of time through science of coronaviruses in general, because this is not the first coronavirus, uh, but the SARS outbreaks of, of years past, it was known in general that these spike proteins are very antigenic or immunogenic, that they are involved in the binding of the virus to the cell receptor, the ACE2 receptor, and uh, therefore, if you can block that spike protein with antibodies, that you might be able to inhibit entry of the cell of the virus into a cell. And so these spike proteins really, from the very beginning, were the major target of these vaccines to try to attack or to block. And they're doing so in many different ways. The most uh, typical actually is not even listed here. And there are some companies that are pursuing the most typical, and that is to inactivate a live to either have a live virus that's attenuated or, or defective in some way, like a measles viruses or chickenpox uh, vaccine, or to um, uh, inactivate it uh, with formalin or other kinds of 
chemicals so that you have the virus structure and the pattern that can be recognized by the immune system, uh, but it's just from a defective virus. So that's really, uh, that's one that is being developed, but it's not top of the list and uh, I would say unlikely to to be given the success of the other platforms. Uh, but so that's the first one that's that's listed here, uh, or, or the, that's one that's not even listed, an inactivated whole virus. So none of these, the point I'm making is in the bottom right corner that none of these actually contain a live virus. Uh, you know, there are live viruses, uh, vaccines out there like the Sabin polio virus I mentioned, the measles virus, the chickenpox virus, and those, and, and uh, the nasal version of the flu virus, those are live virus vaccines and those put patients at risk for actually getting an infection or getting sick because sometimes not 100% of the viruses are inactivated. And so some patients, for example, did get polio-like symptoms and even polio, frank polio from those vaccines. Uh, but that's not the case in all of the top level vaccines being developed for coronavirus. And so the risk of getting sick from a virus infection is zero with these kinds of other uh, vaccine platforms like protein-based, viral vector-based, or mRNA-based. You're not gonna get coronavirus, uh, coronavirus infection. So the, the first one listed is the protein base where they can purify that spike protein and actually give it as a protein injection. And the body reacts to that, makes antibodies against it, and you can get immunity. The second that, uh, and I think these first two are probably going to thought to have been early on the most likely to succeed and most likely to be the quickest. Um, and that is the, the, where the DNA encoding that spike protein is encapsulated into a viral vector like adenovirus, and then that gets it into the cells easily. The bot, the cells make the protein, the spike protein based on that DNA sequence that converts into an mRNA sequence in the cell, and then uh, the cells produce it that get injected with that virus, and then the body reacts to that with antibodies. And then the third, the mRNA, which is obviously, as everyone knows, been the most rapid and the most uh, appears to be the most successful, is where the act just mRNA instead of DNA. Is, is synthesized for that spike protein. And uh, you put that into the cells and that mRNA is immediately translated into protein and then the body reacts to it. So you can see all three of these are along the same lines of recreating that spike protein in the body and having the immune system react to it. What it means is someone who's immunosuppressed or perhaps on high dose steroids, for example, might not have that appropriate reaction with the antibodies. And so there's unknowns there about how, uh, what drugs someone might be on that suppresses their immunity, because we do depend on the body's normal immune response to make a reaction against the spike protein and therefore create immunity against the virus. Uh, so let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about how it was done so quickly, in part just to reassure people that it was done correctly. Uh, so mRNAs can be made rapidly when the sequence is known. And so there's been some articles out, about there, out there that have said, hey, we've had this vaccine since, you know, the day after we knew about coronavirus. And to some extent, that's true. In other words, as soon as the scientists from China who isolated the virus were able to sequence it and give us the genetic code, we were able to just say, okay, here's the sequence for the spike protein. So now we could synthesize that on a machine and make these mRNAs. Uh, that that make that spike protein. So mRNA platform uh, was uh, is very rapid because as soon as you know the sequence, you can create that original virus sequence. Um, and in this case, the platform was already developed. So, uh, but it just hadn't been really tested yet. It's so it's sort of a plug and play as a platform. You say, well, we're going to encapsulate, we're going to synthesize messenger RNA and we're going to put it in a lipid nanoparticle and deliver it. And that was already teed up. And in fact, there was some of the companies that are involved now had were ready to do that because they'd been developing it for the prior SARS outbreak. And they were ready to test a platform like that. And the timing was perfect. They were all, in fact, set to uh, do a, a mock run of, of this kind of platform this spring when the coronavirus uh, epidemic uh, pandemic broke out. And so they quickly pivoted and said, let's not do these old coronaviruses, let's do this new coronavirus plug in the sequence for this mRNA and get it going. So having that, just the timing was impeccable. Uh, we were also fortunate, I think, for that to be in place and that technology to have been developed 
to that point when this when this came about. And and so besides the, the technology being sort of a plug and play and being primed and ready to go, there is a, a, an outbreak paradigm for vaccine development that I've shown in this uh, image where the traditional paradigm up top takes many, many years and you have to identify what's the right sequence. And we're still working on vaccines for herpes virus, for example, that because none of them have worked that well. Uh, but in the outbreak paradigm, uh, it's recognized that, hey, there's an emergency. We need to do this more quickly. Uh, and so we need to uh, compress the timeline. And in this case, you can see that, for example, normally large scale manufacturing wouldn't start until it's been licensed, until you've proven uh, that it works. But in this case, the large scale manufacturing has moved up way earlier. And the smaller scale development manufacturing is is going on as the target identification is being tested and as the safety is being tested. So everything's compressed. So the companies, uh, and due to the, the pre-purchasing, the promise that, hey, uh, a lot of different countries want to buy this if you get it right, uh, and so they knew the money was in hand, um, they were able to do the manufacturing uh, in parallel with some of the safety testing. And so that's why it was able to be done so quickly uh, using this outbreak paradigm, which is a paradigm that was well established in the vaccine community long ago and recognized to be important uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So it's been done quickly, but it's also been done safely with uh, good data collection. So if you go to the next slide, I wanted to show some of the data that just came out two days ago in the New England Journal of Medicine about side effects, in particular for the Pfizer vaccine. Now the Pfizer vaccine is a lipid nanoparticle, so no no external vi no virus involved at all. Lipid nanoparticle encapsulating mRNA that encodes the coronavirus spike protein, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And so we don't expect anyone to be able to get a, a illness, a virus infection, for example. That's not going to happen in these patients because there's no virus involved in it anywhere along the development of this particular vaccine. And the Moderna one that will be reviewed by the FDA next week is very similar in its uh, platform. Uh, so what side effects can you uh, expect? Well, I can tell you from personal experience since I enrolled in the trial, you can get arm pain, kind of like a tetanus shot, uh, and it hurts fairly bad. Uh, mine hurt all, uh, it started about six hours after the injection and pretty much hurt all night, hard to roll over to that side while sleeping. And I could still feel it sort of the next day, all day long. Uh, but then after that, uh, the pain went away. And about 80% of participants uh, also experienced arm pain, either mild or moderate. I, I counted mine as moderate. Um, but other, uh, in addition to arm pain, uh, and they broke it down in their publication by um, age group 16 to 55 and greater than 55, but very similar patterns as you can see. Uh, six, 10 to 15 percent had fever. Again, in the uh, the color shade is mild is green and blue is moderate and orange is severe. And there were none that were grade four, which would be very severe. Uh, but many patients got fatigue, and uh, that was uh, the case in the placebo group as well. And you can see why it's important to have a placebo group. So because some of these symptoms are very nonspecific, and we all might experience them on any given day. And there's also the placebo effect. So uh, that's why they had the placebo group. So you can see how much the difference is between the real thing and the placebo. And so certainly uh, we all can feel fatigued at times. And if you got the vaccine, you might've thought you were gonna feel fatigued. And so there was a significant proportion of patients at mild and even moderate fatigue. And I can tell you that I felt nothing after the first dose uh, after except that arm pain. But after the second dose, three weeks later, um, I, the next day I was super tired, just wanted to crawl into bed all day long. Uh, but then after that felt fine. So you can see that about 60% actually had fatigue during that first dose and 51% the second dose. A similar proportion had headaches and a few, some fewer had chills. Now these are due to the body reacting to the uh, protein, to the lipid nanoparticle. And uh, that's why I think when you start getting to the chills and beyond, the amount in the placebo is, is even less, and that's more specifically due to the vaccine. Uh, skipping over, some patients had more severe uh, reactions, vomiting, diarrhea, but uh, a small percentage 
uh, but a higher percentage with muscle pain and joint pain. Again, in, it's signs of an inflammatory reaction um, and uh, uh, not inconsistent with what was expected, I'd say, for this kind of a trial. Uh, and certainly a number of people used anti-fever uh, medications, antipyretic medications, uh, and, and there's no reason not to. There's no reason to think that Tylenol or Motrin or NSAIDs would get in, in the way of the immune response. Uh, and so um, I think it's one of these things where no pain, no gain, uh, something that uh, we all need to go through uh, in order to have uh, achieve, ultimately achieve herd immunity through vaccination, which is the goal. Okay, so uh, on the next slide that I had, uh, I Joe show just an illustration of different kinds of viruses that they, uh, just to bring home the point that viruses have different shapes, different sizes, different compositions. Uh, some are, have envelopes, some don't have envelopes. Uh, and that the two that are sort of in the discussion are the adenovirus and AAV, because as I, uh, mainly for this community, because AAV, as we all know, is the main vector being used for gene therapy for muscular dystrophy. And adenovirus is one of the ones that's been mentioned as being a carrier of the DNA that encodes the spike protein. And in fact, the uh, AstraZeneca trial and the Johnson & Johnson trials for vaccination uh, for COVID do use an adenovirus to encapsulate the DNA that encodes the spike protein. And so those patients or those subjects who get uh, vaccines from those two companies will be getting an adenovirus encapsulating that. But the molecular patterns, the proteins, the antigens that give that make up adenovirus are completely different from the other viruses. And in particular, they're completely different from AAV. So even though they share adeno, uh, which really is a word that talks about tonsils and uh, where these viruses are, were originally isolated, the AAV is an adeno-associated virus. And what that means, it's a virus that is so small, as you can see, it doesn't have all the genes for all the things it needs. So it's dependent on co-infection with adenovirus uh, genes for it to grow. So when we produce AAV in the lab for gene therapy, we actually are also putting in some plasmids that produce proteins that come from adenovirus that give the function to the cell for it to make and package AAV. But the molecular patterns, the antigens the, of AAV are completely different from the ones in adenovirus. So the immunity response to these different viruses do not overlap. They are specific for each virus. So if you get immunity to an adenovirus, you're not getting immunity to AAV. Now within AAV, the different serotypes do have overlap as we've seen uh, AAV, uh, immune response to AAV9, for example, might also uh, cross react to an immune response to AAV RH74. So the uh, immune response within the AAV category can cross react, but uh, if you get an adenovirus, you're not gonna get an immune response to AAV uh, and vice versa. So. Uh, there's no concern that getting the COVID vaccination would elicit an immune response against AAV or uh, make one not eligible for a future AAV gene therapy trial. So I just wanted to put that concept to rest uh, with some of the, um, uh, because some of the questions that came in for that. And um, we will uh, look at the other questions as they come in on the chat box uh, after uh, we finished the formal remarks, so I'm going to turn it now over to the other Tim to talk more about uh, the vaccine and what we know. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kripe, and uh, welcome all. Uh, Tim and I have actually worked together on several other PPMD programs, so I've had uh, the pleasure uh, of sharing these kind of perspectives on similar problems. And my role now in the continuation of this discussion is to talk a little about the regulatory processes so you understand the timing and pace of what's going on and the framework that FDA and other regulators use in these kind of decision-making processes. So with this first slide, it's just meant to illustrate that FDA's decision-making is based upon data that drug developers or vaccine developers provide, and then they have the opportunity to review that, and I have to 
comment and say, I think that FDA has been doing a spectacular job in uh, reviewing mountains of data in a very short period of time. So we should be appreciative of that. And they have to be the impartial party that takes a step back and say, what are the findings here? And do the benefits outweigh the risks? Those are the points and considerations that protect all of us in society from being too hasty and perhaps not reviewing things thoroughly and, and missing something important. And obviously, if FDA does not have data or they have questions, then they can't make a positive decision. So, so the foundation of good regulatory decision making is, is uh, best science, good medicine, and good design of studies. And I think we've seen that despite the compressed time frame for the COVID virus vaccine studies, that there has been very thoughtful attention to rigorous trial design. So we can have confidence in that way. And we should have confidence as well that FDA is using all appropriate uh, expertise to make sure that the quality, safety, and effectiveness is proven in these matters for the burden of proof for what's now an emergency use authorization, which we'll talk about in a moment. And again, the key is benefits outweigh risk. And that's something not only FDA makes determinations of, but your providers and all patients need to carefully weigh. So you need complete information. And that's part of what these reviews yield from uh, FDA and companies. If I could have the next slide then. So what exactly is the process for vaccine development? Uh, Tim has already shown you the phases of study one, two, three. And I've compressed that just to say that the vaccine has to first be developed in the laboratory. And you've seen three of the four possible routes for that as have already been discussed. And then once one has a preparation that can be appropriately injected, clinical trials are conducted. And uh, it's been overwhelming to look at uh, the work that has been done just since last February when these activities commenced. Actually, in January of this year is when several of the companies began looking at the messenger RNA, mRNA approaches. So not even within a calendar year, we've gone from recognizing a disease to producing vaccines to conducting clinical trials and bringing them to FDA. So truly remarkable. And with the submission of information from the trial sponsors to FDA. They then do internal reviews of the safety, the effectiveness, and the quality, that is the chemistry manufacturing and control used for the vaccine. So we know of consistency and production and in, in its potency and purity and so forth. Uh, an advisory committee meeting was then put together and that's what happened yesterday for the Pfizer uh, BioNTech preparation. And what you'll hear about next week, same thing for the Moderna vaccine. And FDA then has the responsibility of making a decision. Do they grant full approval? Is there sufficient information there? Or do they grant a shorter term contingency approval called emergency use authorization? The latter is what's occurred, and I'll explain that in a, in a moment, and why this emergency uh, authorization is appropriate in these times. It was actually something anticipated way back in 2013 when people were looking at bioterrorism risks and things and thinking about how one may need to expedite vaccines. So with a positive decision by an advisory committee, that's a recommendation to FDA. FDA still has to make an independent decision. They take the advisory committee uh, practice experts like Dr. Kreif into consideration and then have to uh, make their determination. After that occurs, then the Center of Disease Control, uh, their advisory committee on uh, immunization practices, ACIP, then does, and in fact, in this case, has already done the majority of review and said, if there's limited supplies, who should get it first and why? And that then leads to a final distribution decision. 
uh, as many of you have probably read, large pharmacies like CVS, Walgreens, and so forth, who are now uh, appropriately uh, empowered to provide immunizations. So physicians' offices and pharmacies, you can be assured, have the appropriate training, physicians, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, and others to be able to provide the administration. So the question is then, the who's, what's, when's, and how's of uh, vaccine access. And that's something that is an evolutionary process. For the next slide, please, uh, Rachel. So what is this uh, EUA? And it was uh, granted, as I said, about seven years ago. When you boil it down, it's a temporary approval saying there's enough for us to conclude there's satisfactory benefit and risk for the information we have. So why not a full approval? And the answer is uh, under the processes defined for the coronavirus pandemic, there are several allowances for making a shorter term determination of emergency use. So it's available then to those in need with the process ongoing to complete studies to get a full approval. Right now, there's two months of safety data after the administration of these vaccines that allow one to conclude that these kind of short-term risks have been quantitated and they're more than acceptable, as you've already heard in Tim's discussion. Uh, in, in addition, the bar for uh, success in uh, the efficacy or effectiveness of the vaccine was actually set in the initial uh, guidelines from FDA as 50%. So we're seeing with this 90 plus percent for the vi virus vaccines now available, that's an incredible uh, overshoot to the benefit of the public. And that allows the kind of decision-making that FDA is considering now. That with full approval, you really need to understand what are the longer term safety findings, if any, we have reassurances based on what we've seen already that the majority of known or anticipated uh, bad effects from the vaccines have been observed and are, as you've already heard, sore arms, headaches, sore uh, uh, fever, and so forth. And the other thing for full approval is how long does this last uh, in terms of protection? Does it protect for a year, two years? As we're all familiar with influenza, Usually the seasonal differences and the persistence of the antibody stimulated gives us about a year of protection. We're hoping for more here, but we don't know. Uh, so that's the purpose of observing through to a full approval. Next slide, please. And so as you've already heard, and I know the, the concerns of this community are, what about the boys? Will they qualify and what kind of information do we have? So in all of the findings uh, or all of the trials that have been conducted, the minimum age has been 18, except for the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine, which studied individuals age 16 and 17 as well. I want to qualify that. And that, that was actually a topic of hot discussion at the FDA advisory committee yesterday among the experts, that while there was information about uh, individuals age 16 and 17, it was very limited. I think there were about 50 people in the active arm and 50 people in the placebo control arm who were age 16 or 17. And that's compared to 40,000 in the overall trial. So while it's encouraging and no one saw anything of distress in that younger age set, we really don't have a huge amount of experience to guide our expectations in that population. And then for the other vaccines, kind of the leading five by Western companies, they all are looking at age greater than 18. And Tim's already explained the basis for what their uh, vaccine uh, production of antibodies is stimulated by. Next slide, because we want to make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A. So that uh, discussion yesterday at FDA was quite interesting for those of you who viewed it or read the uh, reports on it. There were comments about safety and effectiveness or efficacy, and all of that was quite favorable in terms of the short-term findings and also in terms of uh, 
the uh, likelihood of predicting longer term continued favorable profile. There, there were discussions primarily about uh, whether there would be unanticipated safety findings. There were also conversely some very interesting comments about we don't want to limit the access to this unduly. So let's be thoughtful about what we know that is the proven safety and efficacy and not let that outweigh theoretical risks that we haven't seen any evidence that they will in, in fact occur. So with that, uh, once FDA takes their final action, which may be within the next few days, according to the uh, Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services and the FDA commissioner, then the final determination by CDC's uh, uh, Immunization Practices Committee will take place and doses may become available as early as uh, next week. So the initial amount of doses available are approximately 3 million. We can expect if similar proceedings occur next week with Moderna, that uh, amount will go uh, up significantly. And uh, that other trials that are still ongoing, we just need to see what the data from them shows. Preliminary evidence suggests a similar amount of 90 plus percent efficacy. Uh, on, on these. And I see there are some questions that are popping up about safety, and we can get to those in the uh, discussion uh, for the Q&A. Uh, for the next slide, and we're getting close to the end here. So the question anyone would obviously have is, what, what's my risk? What's my child's risk? Uh, what about the boys? How do we calculate that? Who's in the first group? Who's in the second group? and uh, have included here, and I believe it will be on PPMD's website, uh, an interactive web uh, listing from the New York Times, which allows you to calculate your individual uh, place in line, if you will, after others in, in your area. So it looks at age, location, underlying uh, potential uh, high risk factors and so forth. It's clear that based on CDC's recommendation and concurrence with FDA, the initial group, those who will receive the first tranche of the vaccine would be first responders, healthcare practitioners, and also nursing home residents, and if supply is sufficient, nursing home staff. And then the second group, which may be in the first quarter of 2021, as more supply becomes available, would be higher risk groups. Uh, so people like me over age 65 who may have uh, particular uh, circumstances that would dictate a higher risk than uh, healthy elderly, if you will. Uh, it, it's certainly possible that uh, things such as uh, administration of steroids and so forth may be a factor, but quite frankly, we don't have all the data we'd like to have on that, on whether it's good or bad. And a, a number of you have probably read that treatment of serious cases of COVID, such as in ICUs, includes high dose steroids. So that uh, obviously is, is something that's uh, a two edged sword and needs to be balanced. And then next slide. So what are the knowns and unknowns? Well, we know about the near term efficacy and safety, including allergic reactions up to two months post exposure. You may have seen in the newspapers that based on the uh, United Kingdom already starting these uh, administrations of the Pfizer vaccine, that there have been a, a few what are called anaphylactoid reactions or somewhat serious uh, uh, allergic reactions, but they've been very few. And there was quite an argument at the FDA advisory committee yesterday on not uh, discouraging families whose children take EpiPens and so forth, uh, who may have allergic conditions from not being put in the queue later on as to be uh, vaccine recipients as we accumulate more information. And those are the unknowns. The duration of protection, whether there'll be any remote or unusual events, it's not expected, but that's why we watch for it. And companies are being required to make those observations as their vaccines are rolled out. And if uh, people's reservations about getting vaccine does not help uh, provide herd immunity, if you will, and that could delay the desired effects of the vaccine. So to summarize, 
Next slide, please. And final slide for all of you. What are the best advice and best practices that we can offer you at this point in time, uh, knowing we're all concerned about our children and grandchildren, and especially when we think about uh, the DMD boys who already have so many challenges with which they're, they're dealing. Best practices are still straightforward, using appropriate hand washing, social distancing, and you see my slide there in the lower right, uh, about a 10 foot pole. When you say you wouldn't touch something with a 10 foot pole, six to 10 feet is probably the right distance for uh, uh, our social uh, interactions. Masks, and uh, that happens to be one of my masks uh, at the top. We need to trust science. And I have to say the breakthroughs with mRNA and the rapidity of these processes ought to give us confidence that, that science is serving society well. I would suggest reviewing the vaccines pro and con with your boys, uh, primary care providers. And if nothing else, please strongly consider getting influenza vaccine for this coming season. It would be our anticipation that COVID and influenza together would not be a delightful comfort, uh, confluence for our boys or any of our families to experience. So please strongly consider that. And just to frame this as we need to anticipate that new information and possible modified recommendations will be coming on a frequent basis. That is not bad. That means we continue to learn. And amidst this unprecedented biological threat, we have to continue to learn and modify. Uh, so there are many reasons for optimism in that regard. The few concerns relate to the longer term observation for uh, duration of positive effect and any surprises on other uh, uh, adverse events that may show up. But we have no uh, uh, previews that would indicate those concerns are, are likely at this point. So without further ado, I know you all have a lot of questions and uh, I'm guessing Dr. Kripe will have a lot of the answers given uh, you know his experience at Nationwide Children's and working uh, with young youngsters who have uh, cancer, other immunocompromised. We're looking forward to working all with all of you, not only now, but ongoing uh, as these things uh, come forward. We're excited to continue to work with PPMD to provide best information. Mm -hmm. So uh, best considerations for all of you and uh, I'll turn it back to Rachel and Tim. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank you, Dr. Kripe. Thank you, Dr. Franson. That was really fantastic and all really helpful information as we think about not only people living with Duchenne and how um, they need to think about vaccination, but for all of us as well. Um, so at this point, we'll go ahead and transition to the Q&A session. Um, lots of really great questions. So I will let Dr. Kripe and Dr. Franson just start to dig in if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I think the first set are for me since my they, they were coming in early while I was speaking. And the first one's a doozy. Uh, why would I want to give my son a vaccine that has very little data, less than a year? We have been trying to get drugs for DMD for 10 years. Seems very scary with such little research. And I think uh, the discussion here is really about risk versus benefit. And uh, we, there is risk. We saw there are side effects. We don't know the long-term effects. But I think there's every reason to believe that it will be safe long-term knowing about the science behind it. And uh, I think these mRNA vaccines are way safer than uh, vaccines that are made with whole viruses where or live viruses that we take for granted every day, actually. So, you know, it's not that the research was just started in February. And in fact, part of what I tried to convey was that the platform had been developed and the ideas have been under development for a long period of time, for 10 years or more, uh, in particular for, for coronavirus as well, given the uh, SARS outbreaks uh, that we've had in the past. So uh, those pandemic or those epidemics, they didn't reach pandemic level, but those faded pretty quickly with the social distancing and isolation and contact tracing uh, epidemiologic methods that were used. And so the impetus for those vaccines to be pushed hard uh, kind of died away. So, uh, but with this pandemic, obviously with uh, those, we haven't been so fortunate. And so getting this vaccine pushed um, 
it has been more important. So there is a lot of research backing it, but this was the first time an mRNA vaccine had been used, and uh, especially on this broader, wider scale. And so it was a new technology, it was unproven, and it's really amazing uh, the efficacy. So in terms of what appears to be the benefit, it's really shocking actually. And the side effects are not unexpected and seem to be very low. So the risk benefit ratio seems very, very um, favorable. Now it has to be an individual decision, of course, because there are still some risks. So uh, whether, and it hasn't been tested in the younger people. So depending on the age that you are uh, with DMD or that your uh, son is, uh, that r ratio that has to be considered. Uh, and as the other Tim in, in indicated, there is no data really under age 16. And I think later on, there's a question about whether that will be tested. And I do believe there are plans to lower the age and test uh, children eventually, but I don't know about the timing of that. Uh, the next series of questions asks about interactions with exon skipping technologies, Exondus and uh, Adaloran, et cetera. Um, there's really no reason to think at all that there will be any interference uh, with the vaccination and those drugs. So completely different mechanisms, even though they also act on the RNA level. Uh, you know, if you think about it, the shot that you're getting for the vaccination, it's going into the arm, it's being picked up by the immune cells in the arm, uh, in the tissue there. Those are being presented to the T cells. They go to the lymph node and that's where you get a production of the B cells. Uh, and so it really has nothing to do with the muscle. Uh, when you get those exon skipping drugs, they go to the muscle, they convert the splicing in the muscle, uh, and there's really not any crossover or any interaction. Plus, those are very specific RNAs that are very specific sequences, totally different from the vaccine sequences, so really no risk. Similarly, there's really no risk of interaction with uh, another question brought up, gene editing therapies. Uh, and other current research for Duchenne. So CRISPR-Cas9, completely different systems. They also do in co uh, involve an RNA guide to tell the CRISPR or the Cas9 where to go and do the gene editing, uh, but uh, completely different sequence, not related. The only consideration here though is if a vaccine is using AAV to deliver the spike protein gene, uh, then yes, you will uh, become ineligible, most likely, for any future AAV-based gene therapy. And I looked at a list this morning of about 165 vaccines that are being developed uh, around the world. And there is one out of Boston, Massachusetts General, that's working with Avexis, actually, to use an AAV platform to produce, get the body to produce that spike protein. And so while that might become very effective as a vaccine, that would be one that would interfere with the uh, gene therapy efforts. So I would uh, avoid that one uh, for sure. So um, another question uh, wants to know is, once I receive the vaccine, is it possible for me to unknowingly carry the virus and still pass to someone else? And no, this isn't, the, these vaccines do not have, a, they're not a virus. They're uh, engineering your body. They're, they're basically hijacking your body cells and, and really only the cells in, that are the immune cells that are in the tissue, in the muscle, they're hijacking those to produce the spike protein of coronavirus so that you can get an immune response against it. But there's no virus involved. So you're not getting a virus infection. You're not going to pass a virus infection. And even the ones that encapsulate with the adenovirus, uh, those are defective. They're not replicating. They're just being used as a shuttle, basically a delivery vehicle to get, the, in that case, the DNA into those cells in your arm. So there's no risk of you passing an infection to anyone else. Um, another question asks about being immunocompromised with steroids for long term. We don't know the answer to that, what the impact that will be. I can tell you from our work in cancer, we do vaccinate cancer patients with the flu, even while they're on uh, um, chemotherapy every year, and they still get immune responses. So I think the, the relatively lower dose steroids chronically are an unlikely to interfere with the generation of a robust immune response, but that has not been tested, so we don't know that. Uh, so I would, I would say it's uh, uh, only time will tell, studies will tell, uh, but um, uh, it won't be harmful uh, to be on those, uh, but it may not be as efficacious 
that's a possibility. Uh, so then uh, someone asked, how long do these side effects last on average? Uh, how will, um, uh, and and uh, in, the, in the trial, we had to report on our app every day for the first couple of weeks, any symptoms. So they have those data. And then it was weekly thereafter, unless we got symptoms then more often. Uh, and uh, in the paper that just came out of New England Journal, they basically said most patients got these reactions within one to two days, and then they subsided shortly thereafter was the, the, the term. So uh, whatever that means, uh, means to me that these were very transient. I've heard other anecdotal stories of, of people also having reactions, but taking Tylenol or, or Motrin or something, and then having those reactions go away. And, and so I think very short-lived has to do with just the initial reaction of the shot. Uh, and again, it can happen at both times. We did, didn't, I failed to mention that uh, the schedule of the vaccines are different. So the Pfizer one, which is a lipid nanoparticle, not a virus, is three weeks apart. So 21 days. The uh, Moderna is 28 days uh, apart. And then there are, I think the AstraZeneca one is a single dose. Um, uh, and then someone else asked, could you re-clarify which are which? So the lipid nanoparticles that don't have any virus at all are the Pfizer and the Moderna. Uh, uh, the two that have adenovirus, again, not AAV, adenovirus that encapsulates the DNA, so it's a DNA vaccine, are the AstraZeneca slash um, Oxford virus uh, vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, there's 165 being developed, but those four are sort of the top ones, uh, the quickest that have made it the quickest. But uh, the modeling that I've seen actually suggests we won't reach herd immunity. That is 60 to 70 percent of the population uh, being immune until a year from now, uh, if then. So uh, I think there will be other vaccines that come on the uh, market and that get looked at and that might become available. Uh, depending on how far down any given individual is on the list to get the current shipments. And so it's like, it's possible that there are other vaccines that will be improved, approved and that you might have access to those before you might have access to the ones that are uh, being talked about right now. Um, so I'll give you a chance to take a breath, Tim. Uh, great. Uh, those, those are wonderful points. I, I can address a few of these things quickly, but first let me apologize to those who are concerned about me referring to DMD boys, I, I've actually had the privilege of working with a number of the adult members. And, and this is a personal quirk for me. I still call my 41 year old son, my boy. So uh, I do apologize for that. There was nothing disparaging that. Uh, on the masks, uh, there was a question about the Danish study that had been in uh, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. And uh, I would just highlight that the majority of studies would indicate that mask wearing is appropriate. It's not perfect and it's not gonna be 100% prevention, but short of all of us uh, wearing scuba masks around, uh, I think it's gonna be very difficult to have other barriers and it does have positive effect, not perfect, but positive. Second uh, point, which is unrelated, is asking about whether trials will be done in others under age 16. And as uh, I showed you earlier, the first five in the queue are looking at 18 and above. However, Moderna has started a trial looking at the age groups of 12 to 18. So that is ongoing. Whether it will go in further to uh, younger pre-adolescents, I think is hard to predict. And I know one of the questions asked, well, why aren't trials being done in those age groups? And traditionally it's been uh, that one would complete vaccine or drug trials with adults before moving to younger ages. Uh, that's clearly changed uh, over the past uh, for a number of drugs, uh, for oncology, for infectious diseases, but in the cases of, of vaccines, people usually uh, who are conducting studies would like to see results in adults before transitioning to younger age groups. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'm gonna review some more of these questions because I can't read as fast as others. <laughs> well, I think there's a question about, um, uh, again, I th hopefully there, there, many of them are, are similar, you know, and will this interfere and can you clarify which, which vaccines might get in the way and so, Nothing will interfere with any of the RNA-based treatments, the exon skipping, 
Uh, but the, the AAV vector being developed by Avexis and Mass General uh, as a COVID vaccine would interfere with future gene therapies. I, none of the lipid nanoparticle ones uh, would interfere, and unlikely the adenovirus ones because adenovirus isn't really being used for the gene therapy in, in muscular dystrophy, but it's possible it could be in the future. So uh, the other question I saw scrolling through was about the side effects in terms of allergic reactions, the, is there a possibility of neurologic reactions and autoimmunity? And there, with any vaccine, those can happen very rarely. There was a report out of the Oxford trial, and that's why that got paused, the AstraZeneca trial got paused in the US, a report of a transverse myelitis in a, in a subject in the UK. And that's a neurologic autoimmune uh, likely phenomenon. But the relationship of that to the, vi to the vaccine is, is unknown. Could be true, true, and unrelated. The person might have been destined to get that and happen to do so after that vaccine. When you're vaccine, vaccinating tens of thousands of people, things happen. Similarly, the, uh, if you were pregnant or planned to get pregnant, you were not supposed to sign up for the trial. Of course, there were a couple dozen who got pregnant after they got the vaccination. And so we don't know the outcomes of that yet, but um, time will tell. There's no reason to think it's gonna cause a problem uh, with pregnancy, but uh, they were being very cautious. Similarly, they didn't know, that's why children, I don't think were included at the beginning because it was total unknown now that it's safe in adults. I think it's gonna be safe to test in children. Um, so the allergic reactions is another issue. Tim probably heard about that when he listened to the uh, FDA committee yesterday, there was much discussion about that as well. Uh, and um, there, because of the two that he mentioned in the UK that had reacted, uh, but again, a big unknown. Uh, and uh, those might have been true, true, and unrelated, as we say. So, Tim, have you grabbed any others you want to address? Yeah, two others that I think I can touch on. One was a question about whether someone who has actually had COVID would be a candidate for the vaccine. And according to Dr. Fauci, in an interview, I think, last week, suggested that that would be reasonable at an appropriate time to boost immunity. Uh, so that's, that's one comment. A second on an unrelated matter is asking about uh, why emergency and whether COVID is no more deadly than seasonal flu. At least for as much as we know now, as an example, in the 2008-2009 uh, uh, H1N1 uh, pandemic, the, uh, I believe there were 18,000 deaths in the U.S. and the, uh, the proportionate risk was thought to be under 1%. So far as we know, uh, in the U.S. now, and understanding we haven't done all the testing that we would have liked to, that it's at least tenfold higher as a death rate for COVID. So you can debate what's right in between, but, but I would take issue with this point that's raised about uh, the WHO. The figures here in the U.S. would not support it being uh, similar to seasonal flu. And Tim, I don't know, you may have a different uh, uh, experiential base on that. I'm looking at it uh, on an epidemiologic perspective. No, I think that's great. I think we only have six minutes before the hour ends if, if we're wanting to wrap up here soon, Rachel, but um, I'm still looking at, at other. I, interestingly, I, I didn't know this, but there's a, a comment about uh, uh, the company making re uh, Regeneron partnering with UPenn to give some of their uh, medicines via an AAV vector. And the question is about, again, about cross-reactivity. And studies in AAV show that most people that have antibodies to one AAV have them to many AAVs. And so either a lot of these AAVs are circulating subclinically through the population and we're getting antibodies to them, or and or uh, when you get antibodies to one, they often cross-react to other AAVs. So yes, I think uh, anybody getting those would probably uh, become immune until we figure out how to redose, how to give patients who have pre-existing immunity AAV, which there are options like plasmapheresis potentially, uh, but until that happens, uh, getting any of those would preclude you from getting the, any of the other AAV gene therapies. Um, so uh, a lot of questions, it's fantastic to have all this interest. Um, anything else uh, jump at you, Tim, before? That, that we really need to cover. Because as Rachel said, we can address many of these uh, with on our written comments later. Sure. We apologize we don't get to them all. Uh, there's a lot to scroll through. 
Yeah. I think one question that I'll actually call out because I thought that it was an interesting component to just kind of circle back to. So I think, you know, one of the overarching themes that we're seeing is that we don't have data in Duchenne and we don't have data in the pediatric population. So is vaccination of parents or caregivers um, able to almost act, act as like a proxy protection for our men with Duchenne? Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, the antibody response that you get as a, uh, if you get vaccinated, I think you're, you're asking, will that protect, will that be a herd immunity within the family? Um, is that almost what you're like asking? A micro, I think so. Almost like a microcosm sort of herd immunity. Yeah. I mean, certainly uh, every person around you that's vaccinated or immune because they had COVID before would then become a barrier for that virus reaching you. But it, you're not you know, that individual will still be susceptible if they get exposed. So um, it's similar, a question uh, was raised if, uh, if if you can be a carrier of COVID after the vaccination. And no, uh, these are, do not contain live virus. They are not the infection. They're just a piece of it. And so you're not going to be a carrier of COVID after you've gotten a, a vaccination. Um, and then that's, uh, another question about whether it's one time or it gives repeatedly. So vaccines work best with boosters. We know most of the childhood vaccinations have many shots. You get boosters. And that's why they built the co the Moderna and the Pfizer ones so that you get a booster after three weeks for the Pfizer or four weeks for the Moderna. Uh, some of the others are single dose and they may not be as effective without a booster. Similarly, there's some plans about crossover studies where you might get one of the vaccines from one company and another from another company. There's no reason to do that. It's going to get confusing, uh, uh, but they might work uh, as a booster to each other. Um, so it's at 1228. I think we wanted to wrap up at 1228. Yeah. All right. I, so go I ahead. was just going to re remind folks with one thing, even if you get the vaccines and you are protected, that doesn't give you a, an absolute immunity. So still hand washing, masks, social distancing remain the cornerstones of, of protecting yourself and your families. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Kripe and Dr. Franson. And I think one of the take homes that I will have for all of you on the phone with us today, too, is this is all really great general information about COVID-19 vaccination in Duchenne. But each of your sons or e each of you that's listening um, has unique circumstances. So please talk to your primary care physician, talk to your neuromuscular provider, talk to your pulmonologist, figure out what makes the most sense for you, where you fall in line when it comes to access. Um, and, and and what your game plan is, right? So talk to your physician team and make sure that you have a plan in place, um, whether it's in, in regard to vaccination or if you were to get sick. Um, I do want to plug one really cool resource that we have available right now. Um, so this is our follow-up COVID-19 survey. So I would encourage you to please share your experiences with us. This is really helpful information that we're able to garner from the community and, and really elicit some interesting learnings um, so that we're better able to serve the Duchenne community at large. So um, if you're able to go to our website, parentprojectmd.org backslash COVID-19 survey, fill out that survey if you can. Um, we would really love to have your experience um, written down and, you know, contribute to um, community research at large. And with that, of course, I have to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Dr. Tim Kripe and Dr. Tim Franson, the Tims, as we have uh, uh, been endearing, endearingly referring to them as this week. So we're really grateful for both of you to take time from your days. Um, we recognize that you're busy and that um, pulling something like this together so quickly it is not easy, but we're really just happy to have you with us today. So thank you again for both of you for joining us and for everybody that tuned in. Thanks so much, everyone. That'll conclude today's webinar. Thank Stay you. Healthy. Stay safe. Best wishes.